Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Making History, Carter G. Woodson. It's now a familiar, though still far from uncontroversial, idea that students should be exposed to the history and achievements of people like themselves. Take philosophy, for example. Offering a diverse group of students a steady diet of texts written by dead white men may not be the best way to get them enthusiastic about the subject. Indeed, the way philosophy is usually taught might help explain why professional philosophers are, to this day, overwhelmingly white and male. Conservatives, searching for ways to justify the traditional curriculum, have argued that if the point is to offer students truly foreign and challenging ideas, then why not make them read Plato or Aquinas? After all, ancient Greece was so different from today's societies that its inhabitants might as well have been from outer space, and Aquinas held plenty of views that your average philosophy undergraduate today will find just as alien. Whatever the merits of this defense of the traditional canon, it misses something important, that if students never see anyone like themselves at the front of the classroom or on the reading list, they will almost inevitably conclude that philosophy is not a subject for them. You might assume that such arguments are relatively new. They may seem to be the basis of a campaign for curricular reform that goes back only a few decades or maybe back to the era of the civil rights struggle. At any rate, it's only very recently that they've started to inspire widespread changes in teaching philosophy at universities. It may come as a bit of a shock then to find that the following words were published in 1933 in reference to black colleges in America. They invariably offer courses in Greek philosophy and in that of modern European thought, but they direct no attention to the philosophy of the African. Negroes of Africa have, and always have had, their own ideas about the nature of the universe, time, and space, about appearance and reality, and about freedom and necessity. The effort of the Negro to interpret man's relation to the universe shows just as much as intelligence as we find in the philosophy of the Greeks, there were many Africans who were just as wise as Socrates. Never mind anticipating debates found in today's academy, these words actually sketch out much of the agenda of our own podcast series. But they were not written by someone who would have been considered a philosopher in institutional terms, like Alain Locke and the figures we met in the last episode. The author was rather a historian, indeed the man sometimes called the father of black history. His name was Carter G. Woodson. The book from which we take that quotation is his most famous work, entitled The Miseducation of the Negro. It collects articles he had written for newspapers in the previous years, and makes a case for dramatically changing the approach to educating black students in Depression-era America. Woodson thought that everyone should learn about the achievements of Africans and their descendants, but that it was especially important for black students to learn about black history. He went so far as to say, the reason we are in the position we are in today is because we have not studied our race. Woodson would not have wanted us to stop studying Plato, though. He was a both-and curriculum reformer, not a proponent of either-or. Thus, he was in favor of studying Shakespeare and Chaucer, but alongside black literature, and argued that one should complement one's reading of Thomas Jefferson by looking at his contemporaries, Phyllis Wheatley and Benjamin Banneker. The history of classical Greece and Rome should be taught but so should the history of the Songhai Empire and pre-modern Ethiopia. Woodson devoted his life to making this sort of teaching of history possible. Born in 1875 in Virginia, he was a child of slaves, the only one ever to receive a PhD in history, which he did at Harvard University in 1912. Around the same time Alan Locke put out the famous anthology The New Negro, Woodson produced a collection of texts that could have been called the Not-So-New Negro, it came out in 1926 under the somewhat more serious title, The Mind of the Negro, and collected a wealth of letters and other documents by such luminaries of black history as Wheatley, Banneker, Jupiter Hammond, and Frederick Douglass. Already in 1922, he had published a study of the topic called The Negro in Our History. He also produced an anthology with the self-explanatory title, African Myths Together with Proverbs. Woodson explicitly recognized that such material can be of relevance for philosophy, as when he wrote that 
the philosophy in the African proverbs and in the rich folklore of that continent was ignored to give preference to that developed on the distant shores of the Mediterranean. To disseminate such knowledge, he launched an academic journal called the Journal of Negro History, as well as a more popular outreach publication, the Negro History Bulletin. This was sold below production costs to increase its circulation, and even had a children's page. This effort may be compared to the bronze booklets put out by Alain Locke, a similar endeavor intended to raise consciousness and improve knowledge of black culture and history. Though Woodson briefly worked at Locke's academic home, Howard University, his activity was mostly undertaken under the aegis of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which he founded in 1915. Woodson was constantly having to seek funding to support the work of the association, much of which came from the Rockefeller Foundation. In the end, the money stopped coming, leading him to complain bitterly about the inconsistent philanthropy of white donors, which in his view had retarded rather than aided the progress of the race in America. His struggles here are reminiscent of the difficulties faced by the American Negro Academy, which we covered back in episode 69. Despite the challenges, he was glad to work outside the confines of the black colleges of the time, which he considered to be academically unserious, having failed to produce historical research of the highest standard. As that may suggest, and as many contemporaries observed, Woodson was a difficult man. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote that he was almost contemptuous of emotion, he had limited human contacts and sympathies. But the tone adopted by Woodson in his attempts to spread knowledge of black history was reassuringly non-confrontational, in part because of his stance of scholarly detachment. He assured readers that his association published nothing aimed at engendering race hate and sought only to set forth facts in scientific form, for facts properly set forth will tell their own story. There can be no doubt that his greatest success in inspiring enthusiasm for his chosen subject was his invention in 1926 of Negro History Week, which was later transformed into Black History Month, sometimes known today as African Heritage Month. Du Bois recognized the power of this contribution of Woodson's early on, describing it in 1940 as perhaps the greatest single accomplishment of the Black artistic movement of the 1920s. This may seem a rather surprising judgment, given how many great works of art the Harlem Renaissance produced. Still, there is something prophetic about it, given that we are talking about an annual month-long celebration of learning with which people of all walks of life are familiar today. While Woodson is thus most often remembered for his popularizing efforts, he would not want us to forget his historical research, which was aimed at fellow experts. He collected many precious 19th century manuscripts, an invaluable trove of information about the Black experience in America, some of it still held at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Again, there's a comparable effort of the period worth mentioning, the Schomburg Library in New York City. And if you have a good memory, you may recall that Arthur Schomburg was for a time the head of the aforementioned American Negro Academy. Woodson understood the value of testimony from ordinary people and used his journal to present archival material recording the words of former slaves, letters about the American Colonization Society, and documents charting the course of the abolitionist movement. Famous names attracted his attention as well, though. He took on the task of organizing the papers left by Frederick Douglass and helped important early scholars of Douglass's life and thought like Philip Foner. Woodson's journal mounted an early challenge against the notion that slavery had been a largely benign and benevolent institution. If you've ever seen old Hollywood movies about the South, you'll have seen representations of this fantasy. At the time, though, it was more than a popular and, for white people, reassuring myth. It was historical orthodoxy. Woodson called such accounts of slavery apparently scientific, but in fact mere propaganda. In 1935, his journal published a refutation of the narrative by John B. Cade, and its pages also included critical reviews of works on the topic that failed to understand what the Negroes have thought and felt and done. From the time of his earliest contributions, Woodson himself offered historical studies whose dispassionate tone barely concealed his burning desire to correct the record. A piece on the history of race mixing, published in the third issue of the journal in 1918, charted the long history of unsuccessful attempts to get white men to stop fathering children with black women. This, in effect, took up the project of Ida B. Wells, showing the pervasiveness of sexual oppression and violence as a fundamental part of American race relations. In 
leaving no sacred cow unslaughtered, Woodson even pointed to the sexual activities of such men as Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. And like any good historian, he endeavored to make his readers see old events in a new light, as when he pointed out that the plight of captured Africans actually worsened in the wake of the British ban on the slave trade, since they now had to be smuggled more carefully and efficiently, and were thus packed even more tightly into slave ships. Similarly, he observed that among the victims of slavery in the American South were the white poor, who could not get work when plantation owners could call upon free slave labor. While such details may be of more interest to the historian than to the historian of philosophy, it's worth our dwelling on them because they illustrate what Woodson thought history was for. Often, you'll hear it said that we should study this subject in order to anticipate the future, as in that old saying that those who do not know the past are condemned to repeat it. But this is not what Woodson thought. Unlike Marxist historians, he believed that major events are inherently unpredictable, and that there is no underlying large-scale causal pattern that a historian can uncover. He wrote that, the significant developments in history have never been thus determined, only the temporary and the trivial can be thus forecast. Rather, we study history to know where we have come from, to take warning or inspiration so that we can do our best in the here and now. The point of teaching people about the achievements of black people, whether in relatively recent times or as long ago as ancient Egypt, was quite simply to show them that black people are capable of such things. He believed that the opposite message was being subtly but relentlessly conveyed by history as it was normally taught. The oppressor, he argued, teaches the Negro that he has no worthwhile past, that his race has done nothing significant since the beginning of time, and that there is no evidence that he will ever achieve anything great. And to the same effect, the Negro has never been educated. He has merely been informed about other things which he has not been permitted to do. As we've already suggested, the point remains relevant. Black students who get through a whole philosophy degree without studying a single black author might naturally conclude that this subject is quite literally not for them. And of course, the same goes for other disciplines. Woodson's analysis shows that racist oppression can be quite effective without involving violence or even the threat of it. There's a passage he found worth repeating more or less verbatim no fewer than three times in The Miseducation of the Negro, no doubt because it makes this point so powerfully. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his special benefit. His education makes it necessary. This is not to say that Woodson saw his task as a historian to be simply the glorification of black achievement. He certainly did quite a lot of that, especially in his more popular work. But his real mission was simply to integrate black history into the study of history more generally. And as we've already quoted him saying, to let the facts tell their own story in all their irony and detail. After all, Africans and their descendants abroad had a complex and fascinating story, or rather many stories. So why not learn about them rather than, as he put it, whether Henry VIII lusted more after Anne Boleyn than after Catherine of Aragon. He insisted that the education of any people should begin with the people themselves, but Negroes thus trained have been dreaming about the ancients of Europe and about those who have tried to imitate them. The deeper implication of Woodson's argument is that writing and teaching about history is never ideologically or politically innocent, never merely a recitation of facts or an analysis of facts. Rather, it always expresses a view on what is worth knowing, and thus, by implication, what is not worth knowing. Thus, he wrote that education as it existed in his America was tacitly designed to justify slavery, peonage, segregation, and lynching. Black people exposed to this sort of indoctrination in the religion of the strong have accepted the status of the weak as divinely ordained. Such pronouncements convey a rather bleak picture of Black America in the early 1930s when the miseducation of the Negro appeared, even if Woodson was pointing the way toward improvement. This represents a change of heart on Woodson's part. An unpublished manuscript from about a decade earlier called The Case of the Negro had been far more optimistic. It was unsparing in its criticisms of white oppression, 
as when Woodson writes that the whole history of the white race has been cruelty in the extreme. But catching the spirit of the Harlem Renaissance a few years before Locke published The New Negro, he proclaimed that attitudes had become far less defeatist than in previous generations. Now in 1921, like other oppressed races, the Negro is learning to strike back. The later Woodson would be more critical of the black community, even, or especially, the so-called talented tenth, whom he accused of turning their backs on their less fortunate brethren. The training offered at black colleges was not fit for its purpose, because it was both too committed to the value of white culture, all that Shakespeare and Henry VIII, and because it was not practically oriented towards getting students into good professional careers. When he complains about this, Woodson can seem to be echoing arguments already rehearsed by Booker T. Washington in the 1890s. Just as Washington loved to tell the story of a black man in a hovel studying French, Woodson contrasts the useless studies of classical texts, including Plato and Aristotle, to advantageous training in such pragmatic topics as trading wool. He says, in true Washingtonian spirit, the race needs workers, not leaders. Again, like Booker T., Woodson likes to allude to his own hard upbringing. Before ascending to academic stardom, he had driven a garbage truck and worked in the coal mine. The miseducation of the Negro is full of complaints about black people shirking a hard day's work, overspending on luxuries like elegant coats, and failing to cooperate to achieve economic independence. At a time when many black intellectuals were attracted by or fully committed to socialism, Woodson was convinced that capitalism was here to stay. The communist ambition of achieving full economic equality would fatally undermine the initiative and invention which have developed the wealth of the country. Tellingly, that quotation comes from a piece called Only the Trailblazer Succeeds in Business. That sound you hear is Booker T. Washington rolling over in his grave, but only so that he can applaud in agreement. Still, there's more going on here than a reprise of the Tuskegee program. Woodson's insistence on vocational training may seem unrelated to his mission as a historian, but in fact, these are two sides of the same coin. He wanted black people to be offered education that was relevant to them, to their interests and needs. This implied training them in fields where they could realistically expect to succeed, just as it implied teaching them a history that was recognizably theirs. As a young man, Woodson had spent time in the Philippines and had a formative experience he mentions in The Miseducation of the Negro. He saw how educational efforts there were transformed when Filipino students were offered books about their own country instead of the United States. Like Washington's rival, Du Bois, Woodson opposed the relinquishing of cultural uniqueness. The ever-perceptive Alain Locke even described Woodson's book as a plea for Black Zionism. Of course, Woodson's proposals concerning education are, in a sense, generalizable. He naturally focused on the interests and needs of Black people, but you can apply the same argument to women, or any racial or ethnic group. There are those who worry that this will lead to a fragmentation of the curriculum, with women's colleges offering courses on women's history, black colleges on black history, and so on. But remember that Woodson explicitly said that black people should read Shakespeare and learn about European history too. Turning this around, he would also encourage white people to learn about black history, even if it is not as existentially crucial for them to do so. As Woodson says, upholding a cosmopolitan approach to the histories of all races and nations, no one can be thoroughly educated until he learns as much about the Negro as he knows about other people. In short, he was a without any gaps kind of guy. And yet, right after describing Woodson's rather cold personality, Du Bois added a more substantive critique. He had no conception of the place of woman in creation. If this was a fair accusation, then it would show that Woodson's universal approach to education had a blind spot. Careful thought should have shown him that, on his own principles, black women have an urgent need to learn about the history of black women. Happily, it seems that he did think carefully about this, or at least thought about it more than Du Bois's passing remark would suggest. Woodson's anthology, The Negro in Our History, offered sketches of many prominent women. He occasionally highlighted women in his own research, as when he wrote an essay on the Negro washerwoman, describing the pivotal economic contribution made to many 19th century black families by women who took in washing to make extra money. Women were also prominent in his association, with Mary McLeod Bethune 
serving on the Executive Council and then serving as president from 1936 to 1952. Finally, his journal published studies by women intellectuals, including Mary Church Terrell and Zora Neale Hurston, who shared Woodson's conviction that it was well worth recording Black folklore. In fact, Woodson himself hired her to do just that. As we'll see next time, Hurston combined anthropological research with literary ambition to produce works that have now become famous, notably her novel Their Eyes Were Watching God. So watch out for an episode on her, which will appear on September 5th, when we'll be returning from summer break here on The History of Africana Philosophy. Mm-hmm.